tamam başlıyoruz. Okay friends, uh, bu kids last lecture is gonna continue on matrix on complex manifolds. So thank you very much for nice lecture. So we can start. Yeah. It's my pleasure. Uh, now let me first share my screen. But... Uh, last time. <coughs> also record record yourself yes. in any case. Uh, last time I uh, we looked at the properties of Karatevadori metric and uh, Kobayashi metric, and today uh, I want to look at the completeness. I want to show that for any bounded Q, Karatevadori metric and uh, also, Kobayashi metric are complete with respect to that metric. Well, let me first share my screen. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Actually, I was planning to uh, say a few words about Bergen metrics today also, but I realized that it will take too much to explain the background of it. So uh, that will be for maybe another uh, series of lectures. Yes. <coughs> okay. So, uh, now there is one last theorem that I want to. Show. I want to talk about. I believe that we didn't talk about this theorem. If uh, I remember wrong, please do tell me so. Uh, so, if we take a domain <coughs> such that the Kobayashi metric is non degenerate, I mean, that means not identically zero on the domain, and we fix a point in this domain, take a holomorphic function that fixes P to the point P. Uh, and suppose that this is an isometry of either the Kerodori metric or Kobayashi metric. That is, uh, you suppose that either the pullback uh, of the metric with respect to this function is equal to the value of the metric at that point, or the same with Kobayashi metric. And we also want the metric not to vanish at the point P. I mean, we don't want FKU P is equal to zero or FKU C is equal to zero. Then we say that F is a conforming map of U onto U. Now, <clears throat> first observe that uh, since U is non-degenerate, uh, C minus this domain must contain at least two points. Because otherwise, by Montas theorem, any family of polar functions taken, uh, sorry, then otherwise, uh, the metric will be identically zero. So if 
this is the case, by Montel's theorem, any family of holomorphic functions taking values in U will be normal. So, uh, since we take if P is equal to P, uh, the requirement that, uh, the, I mean, we will do it for one metric and the second is the same. So the requirement for uh, this pullback of our metric at the point P equals the value of the metric at the point P. It implies that F prime P is equal to one. You can directly see this uh, by write the definition of pullback metric. So now we want to define a sequence of functions f power j uh, by letting f1 to be f, f2 to be f composed with f, and fj to be uh, fj minus 1 composed with f. Then we want to examine the sequence, of course. First of all, uh, fj is a normal family because it it's uh, defined on U, it's holomorphic, so it's it, by Montas theorem, it is a normal family. Then we have the derivative of fj at the point P is equal to the jth, uh, j, jth uh, of the derivative of f, f at the point of P. So this means that uh, the derivative of f j at the point p and the magnitude of it is equal to 1 for all j. So this means that we can find the subsequence f j r such that this subsequence, the derivative of uh, f j r at the point p converges to 1. So this is not an immediate result. Uh, as an exercise, you should find out why. Uh, now, by passing to another subsequence, if necessary, and we will still see, uh, call the subsequence FJR because it is not necessary to keep up with sub in this setup. Uh, so we can find the holomorphic function F tilde such that the subsequence converges to F tilde normally. Since we defined uh, f primes accordingly, we have the derivative of uh, f tilde at the point p is equal to 1. Now, <clears throat> what we claim is that uh, this function is equal to identity. So, suppose not. Uh, for simplicity, let p is equal to 0. Then for uh, points near the uh, near zero, we have f hat z is equal to zero plus z plus some higher order terms. And uh, let us suppose a m z to the power m be the first non-vanishing higher order term after z. So m is greater than. Then, if you look at these f hats, the j uh, term of this f hats, f2, f hat 2 is f hat composed with f hat, and it is z plus 2 a m z to the power m plus some other terms. f3 is uh, compo f hat composed with f hat composed with f hat, and it is equal to z plus g a m z to the power m plus some higher terms. And likewise, f hat, uh, to the f hat k is equal to uh, the composition of f hat k times, and it is equal to z plus k times a m z to the power m. Now, if you take the nth derivative of uh, f hat k, then this is equal to m factorial times k times a m. So, as you can see, if you send k to infinity, this value goes to infinity. But we know that f hat k is a normal family. The normal convergence passes to derivatives by Cauchy estimates. 
So this gives us a contradiction. The only way to get out of this contradiction is to take am to be zero. But then f at z is equal to z. So what we have here is uh, we have a sequence of functions that emerges to identity normally. Now we claim that this implies f is conformal. Now to see this, we take the uh, family fjl minus one. This is also a normal family, so it has a normally convergent subsequence, say fjr minus one, and converging to some function g. And g is not constant since uh, g prime p is different from z. Then you have this composition of f with g at the point C is equal to composition of F with the limit of this FJR minus ones. So this is actually the composition of, uh, this is actually the limit as R goes to infinity FJR and it is equal to that. Similarly, you can show that G composition F set is equal to that. This means that F is one to one and one to and you should remember or check why this is so. Since F is also homomorphic, we conclude that F is conformal. So, uh, as for references, uh, the first reference is Kobayashi's Hyperbolic Manifolds and Holomorphic Mappings. It's a textbook, but it's an advanced tech textbook, but somehow it is classical, so I decided to include it here. If you want to, uh, if you know about complex manifolds and want to study hyperbolic manifolds, this is a good textbook. Uh, now the second one is the book we are following, Grant's Complex Analysis Geometric Viewpoint book. Third one is a paper by Grant's uh, as well. It's uh, it is the creditory and Kobayashi metrics and applications in complex analysis. Uh, you can find it in archive, and I included the link here. And the fourth one is uh, a paper from Simha, and it uh, examines the creditory metric on the analysis. And it's an interesting paper to look at. And with this, I want to go back. To the completeness subject. Let me give me a minute to share my screen. So, uh, we want to uh, find out if the, if we uh, take a domain, if it is bounded, uh, so if it is complete with respect to predatory or Kobayashi matrix. So, uh, before uh, going to the completeness uh, discussion, we need to make a few remarks, beginning re remarks, and recall a couple of uh, theorems from uh, analysis of geometry, if you like, calculus, actually. Uh, so the first proposition is uh, we take a bounded domain. Uh, we are examining completeness in bounded domains. Uh, we take a bounded domain in a complex plane. We take a complex set uh, in, in this uh, domain, 
We denote rho C, rho K uh, as, and rho E as the kaidatory Kobayashi and Euclidean matrix on omega, respectively. Then we claim that there are constants C1, C2, C3, C4, and these constants depend on both the compact set and the omega, uh, I mean your depth domain, uh, and these constants satisfy for any z in your uh, compact set. C1 is less than or equal to less, uh, rho C z over rho Euclidean z, and it is less than or equal to C2, and the same is true with Kobayashi metric and with C3 and C4. Note that this shows that the matrix uh, Kobayashi metric, Theodore metric, and Euclidean metric are equivalent on bounded domains. Now we will prove the second inequality. Uh, the proof of the first one is similar, actually a little bit easier. So let us take a point in the omega, omega and uh, a radius such that this radius is obviously greater than zero, but less than or equal to the Euclidean distance between this point and boundary of omega. Uh, let uh, DPR and DP2R be closed disks in omega. Since we have uh, the, the uh, we, we defined while we were uh, giving the definition of Kobayashi metric, if you recall, we defined this uh, D P U P sorry U D to the power P uh, thing. If you look at as holomorphic functions from P to D such that uh, the value at the point zero is equal to p. And we took the, uh, for the Kobayashi metric, we took the inform of the, the, the uh, those functions, the value of those functions, one over those functions, and found the Kobayashi metric. Now, since when we take uh, dp2r and d, to the power of p, this is a subset of omega d to the power of p. For z, not x, there is a typo. In dpr, we have the Kobayashi metric on this disk is greater than or equal to Kobayashi metric on omega. And we also have uh, the Kobayashi metric at the disk P to R to be equal to one over two R, the Kobayashi metric at the unit disk. Uh, but the value here, the value we take here is Z minus P over two R. Remember that we do this by uh, finding a map from uh, the disk with center P and radius two R to the unit disk. Uh, so the Kobayashi metric is equal to the Poincaré metric on the unit disk. And since we have Z minus P less than or equal to R, we have P, uh, the, the value of the metric uh, for unit disk at the point Z minus P over 2R, we compute that with using second, uh, sorry, uh, parametric, we see that it is less than or equal to four over three. Now we combine the two estimates and get uh, the Kobayashi metric of the point C in the domain omega is less than or equal to four over three times one over two R. Now note that since uh, omega is bounded, there is a radius 
such that omega ca can be sit inside the disk centered at origin with that radius. So by a similar argument as above, uh, if you take Z in uh, the disk with center P and radius R, you can get this estimate. You can get uh, the value of Z uh, of the Kobayashi metric in the domain omega is greater than or equal to one over big R. So when you put everything together, brain is that in a uh, small disk centered at P with radius R, we have this inequality. It is less than or equal to, equal to 4 over 6 R, greater than or equal to 1 over big R. So L is compact, so we can cover L by a finite number of disks of this form and then get a uniform estimate for all Z in our compact set. Euclidean distance is given by rho EZ is equal to one. So this means that uh, you have C3, which is equal, you have a constant C3, which is equal to C3 times one, but one is equal to Euclidean metric. So, and this is equal to less, this is less than or equal to Kobayashi metric, value of Kobayashi metric. And similarly, there is the constant uh, Kobayashi metric at set uh, is less than or equal to C4. You can write it as C4 times the leading metric point set and this completes the proof. Now as a corollary, uh, this, EP, this is an immediate corollary of course, the topology induced by any of the correct theodore Kobayashi or Euclidean matrix is equivalent to the other two when the, your domain is a bounded domain. Uh, as an exercise, you can show that any sequence that is Cauchy with respect to Kobayashi metric is also Cauchy with respect to correct Theodore metric. So uh, before going, we need some definitions. These are basic definitions and a couple of theorems from geometry. Uh, you probably know that, know these definitions already. We take a curve from AB to the complex plane, it is called closed twice continuously differentiable curve. If it is twice continuously differentiable, uh, the derivative of it is different from zero. Gamma A, the value of gamma at the point A is equal to the value of gamma at the point B, and the one sided derivatives up to and including order two at the point A equal those at the point B. We write gamma is C2 and it is closed. Similarly, you can define closed K times continuously differentiable curve accordingly. And a domain is said to have a CK boundary if the boundary consists of finite many CK closed curves. If a function or a boundary is CK for every K, then we say that the function or boundary is CK. Well, uh, you should see that uh, sometimes it is more convenient to think uh, of a domain with CK boundary as given in the form uh, like uh, Z is in some here complex plane, Z is in complex plane, rho z is less than zero. Where rho z is a CK function with gradient different than zero <clears throat> on the boundary of the uh, domain, of course. We call this rho, <clears throat> rho a defining function for you. Now, it is practical to use this uh, 
form in uh, calculations. So uh, as an example, you can uh, take unit disk and you can express it in this form like z uh, absolute z square minus one less than zero. The points in C such that absolute z square minus one less than zero is the unit disk. Well, uh, you can uh, immediately say that see that a bounded domain infinitely many holes will not have a CK boundary when K is greater than or equal to one because any defining function will fail to be smooth at an accumulation point of the holes. So this is the direct consequence of uh, defining in this way. <coughs> Now, uh, observe or recall that from uh, geometric classes, maybe, differential geometric classes, a domain with twice continuous differentiable boundary uh, has a, at the each boundary point P a well defined unit outward and a well defined unit inward, inward normal. Now, if you take the functions which takes uh, the point on the boundary to its outward normal and uh, the function which takes the point P to its inner normal and these functions are continuously differential. Now we need some results about domains with C2 boundary before going further. So uh, let's briefly discuss them. First of all, <clears throat> if you use a domain with C2 boundary, then there is an open neighborhood W of boundary U, such that if Z is in uh, the intersection of U with this uh, neighborhood, then there is a unique point P on the boundary U, which is nearest in Euclidean distance to Z and this means that by taking this infimum, there is a point on the boundary which gives you the distance uh, from your point Z to the boundary. We call W a tubular neighborhood of boundary. So uh, let's look at the proof briefly. Well, we take a function from boundary u cross minus one, one open interval to the complex plane. Uh, we define it as, uh, this is the function which takes the point qt to the point q plus t times outer normal at the point q. Now you can think of t as a map from the real space boundary u cross minus one one to real space R square, which is actually C, something we have, which is equal to C. So alternatively, you can take a gamma, uh, a C2 parameterization of the boundary U, and set T as the map from 0, 1 cross minus 1, 1 to complex plane and define as the uh, map which sends the point st to gamma s plus t times the out outward normal of s. So you take, uh, if you look at the figure, you take values from the uh, this place, the first component is on boundary u, second component is an element of minus one one line and you take them to these uh, zip like place on R square. So we fix a point Q0 on the boundary Q without loss of generality we may suppose that the tangent line uh, to 
the boundary at the point Q0 is horizontal. If not, you can just apply a change of coordinates to get this tangent, uh, to seek this tangent line at the horizontal, at the y-axis. Uh, also, without loss of generality, we can normalize the vector. Then, when you calculate the Jacobi matrix of T at Q0, 0, you get, one, you get the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. So this is obviously an invertible matrix. So this means that you can use inverse function theorem, which says there is a neighborhood B0 of the point Q0, 0, such that T is invertible on B0. Then, if you define WQ0 as the image of T V0, this is a neighborhood of Q0, such that when Z is in WQ0, there exists a unique Q on the boundary U and a unique T in uh, the open sec minus one one, which Z is equal to Q plus T times outward normal at the point Q. Now this means that Q is locally the unique nearest point in boundary to Z and the distance from Z to Q is absolute value of T. Now we want to go global so we set W, we let W is equal to the union of all such WQ zeros in this complex group. Now, uh, here note that we needed a C2 boundary for to apply the inverse function term. So in any setup, if you have a theorem which an inverse function like theorem, you don't actually need the boundary to be C2. You can do this with other conditions. So we have a proposition. Uh, this is also from calculus. You take a bounded domain with C2 boundary, then uh, there is a radius R0 such that for each P on the boundary, we can find the disk center at some point, depending on P, and R0, which is external ta tangent to, this, to the boundary of U. And similarly, we can find another disk uh, with center C prime P, which is the point that depends on P, and R0, which is internally tangent to boundary U at point P. And here you can see the, the outer and internal uh, uh, disks, these tangents. And moreover, we have uh, the closure of disk center that point CP and radius, which radius R intersection boundary U is only the point P. And again, the closure of the disk center C prime P and radius R intersected with boundary U is only the point P. Now I want to give the proof of this proposition, but check out the proof from the from, uh, textbook. Uh, the details are mostly for calculus. But you have to you wait you have to deal with them to uh, see how they go, and then we use the first part of it is mostly calculus, and the second part is, is uh, you find some local disks uh, with the help of calculus and you correct them by using tubular problems. Uh, so let us give five minutes break before uh, showing that if you take a bounded domain with C2 boundary, then it is complete with uh, respect to the credit on the metric. Uh, there is questions in the 
Yes, chat. I'm trying to access the chat box. <laughs> Only at zero. Only at zero at what? For what? So, can you give a little context? Give me slides. Okay. That was an old question. Yes. Turn uh, back. I, I saw there was a question, but I couldn't access the chat box. So, uh, well, did it, we compute things in uh, the point zero, if I recall right? I don't have the slide right now. Uh, on my screen, but uh, we do it at the point zero, but then you can take zero, any point to zero or zero to any point by conforming maps. So the other points don't really pose a problem. Maybe I didn't tell it there. Does it answer? Kill the exit, is it? Let me get this light. No, P, P is any point. Um, we, we took, again, we, we, we took uh, point P as zero because uh, because we wanted uh, things go, we, we wanted the proof look simpler. <laughs> you can do it for any P. For, uh, at the beginning of that part, we said that for simplicity, we take P is equal to zero. So you can actually do that for any point. But you need to uh, adjust the uh, polynomial, uh, the, what? We wrote uh, AM Z plus to AM Z M. Instead of that, you will have z minus p plus 2 a m z minus p to the point m. And uh, the rest will go on. So, uh, so we will, can, shall we continue at uh, quarter past the hour, Mustafa? Okay, okay. So I'm here, but so uh, let's give it a break. Yeah. Questions, but I you uh, made the announcement about Bergman kernel metric. Let, let uh, me do that again. I I, I will. Uh, sorry, I, I'm if if there's any if there is enough interest, of course I will. I'm planning to uh, do a session about Bergman metrics in another uh, course. Of mini series, and I'm planning to do this. Uh, I'm planning to give the burden uh, metric on 
uh, first context plane and then see what happens on the several context setup, on the several context setup. Okay, then if there but, is any... But it, it, it might audience. be longer for than this. I see. I see. Okay, if there is enough audience, we can do it in later schools. Okay, or yes, online yeah. schools. Sure. All right, so but, let's give a five-minute break. Yeah. yeah. Berman metric is uh, actually a very nice metric to work at. Things go very smoothly. And uh, so I will also uh, include a reference which, ex which is about burden kernel and burden metrics. But anyway. Okay, then let's meet at 20 past three or something. Uh, sorry, again? Let's meet in 20 past three or, is it okay? 20 past, 20 past, okay, okay, that's perfect. Okay, all right, let's meet then. So I'm here, but I'm just stopping my video. If you, okay, then let me share screen. So, uh, the theorem is the completeness of character domain trick when you take a bounded domain with a C2 boundary. Uh, now, of course, we do this for character domain trick, but uh, when we do that, it is uh, also true for Kobayashi metric in a similar method, or if you use the cool, if you want, you can use the coolness of these two metrics on the disk uh, on the bounded domains. Uh, now, while we were looking at uh, the Poincare metric for proof, we should first see that, uh, you should first remember that while we were uh, working on Poincare metric. We casually observed that the boundary of the unit disk was infinitely away from the center with respect to the Poincare metric. Now, showing Cauchy sequences converging Poincare metric was an exercise. If you attempted that exercise, uh, you probably realize that this is true because Cauchy sequences sit comfortably away from the boundary. So, no sequence can escape to a limit point on the boundary of D. So if you, when your sequence sits away from the boundary, it is uh, the, the, the proof is done as usual. And if a point, uh, if your sequence goes to a limit point, then you show that it cannot be Cauchy. So although D is an open set, uh, we could conclude that uh, the unit disk with Poincare metric is a complete matrix space. Now here, we have the same problem. U is a domain, so it is open. Uh, so in order to say that U is complete, we need to understand what happens when we approach to the boundary, when we are near the boundary. And to be able to do that, uh, we, technically we need a more familiar environment. So what we do is we take our domain, send our domain to the external tangent disk for a point on the boundary, and then send that external tangent disk to the unit disk, and then work, out, work our way, way out from there. So, to do this, let's take a uh, point in the tubular neighborhood W of the boundary. 
So we want to understand what happens uh, when the point set is near the boundary. So let us take a point near the boundary in W. Uh, let P be the nearest boundary point to Z. We said that the, the, this point exists and it is unique. And let D C P R0 be, be the external tangent disk for the point P. Now, uh, after doing this, uh, after talking about the setup, we define the point IP uh, as an inversion which sends our uh, domain to the disk with center the, the external tangent disk, this centered CP, and which we use R0. So this takes, takes the point zeta from the domain and sends it to the point CP plus I zero squared over zeta minus CP. This is holomorphic, obviously, and it inverts you into the external tangent disk. Then we take another map, JP. This map sends the disk with radius R0 and center CP to the unit disk. More uh, explicitly, it takes the point zeta from the external tangent disk and it sends it to zeta minus CP over R0. This is also holomorphic. And you know that creditory matrix is distance increasing. So what we is actually um, an inequality, which says the value of creditory matrix at the point C uh, of with respect to the whole domain is greater than or equal to the pullback back metric of these of the composition of these two maps with creditor metric at the unit disk. And when we take the value of this thing with respect to that. So if you write the definition of uh, pullback metric, you get you see that this is equal to uh, the derivative of the composition at the point Z, the magnitude of the derivative of the composition at the point Z times the value of creditor metric with respect to the unit disk uh, at the point JP composed with IP Z. So uh, we want to examine the terms in this expression. First note that uh, if you take the Euclidean distance from Z to boundary U, then the absolute value of Z, Z minus CP is equal to delta plus R0. Because uh, and if, you, if you roll back and you look at the uh, figure, you see that the point P is the nearest point on the boundary to Z. And R0 is the radius of this external tangent disk. So the magnitude of the, the distance from the feeding distance from Z to the CP is exactly delta plus R0. Uh, then you can calculate the distance, uh, the domain of uh, the derivative of the composition at the point Z. We define these maps so you can just uh, write down your equation and see that it is the absolute value of R0 over delta plus uh, R0. This has to be little r0, there is a typo, square. So <clears throat> you can also call, calculate the uh, function JP composed with IP. And this is equal to R0 over Z minus CP. 
and then calculate the magnitude to fit, absolute value of fit. And if you do that, you see that this is equal to 1 minus delta over delta plus R0. Now, uh, when we do this, we send our points from our uh, domain to the unit disk. So, uh, when, when we are working with creditor metric on the unit disk, it is the same with Poincaré metric. So we can use Poincaré metric in our calculations. When we do that, uh, you, say, you see that the uh, creditor metric at the unit disk of the point uh, JP composed with IPZ is equal to the Poincaré metric at the same point and it is that expression. And if you estimate that, you see that it is greater than or equal to R0 over 2 times 1 over delta. Now you put all these together and see that uh, the creditor, the value of Z, at, or uh, the value of creditor metric at the point Z with respect to the whole domain is greater than or equal to C0 times 1 over delta. But here C0 is a constant and it depends on the radius R0. What does this mean? This means that if you take Z close to the boundary, delta decreases. So FCU, the value of FCU at the point Z increases unbounded. Now, take a point P0 in U. Uh, with some work, you can show that the creditory distance from P0 to P is equal to some constant times 1 plus rotating 1 over delta. Here, Z is a point with uh, Euclidean distance to the boundary is equal to delta, and C is a constant derived from <coughs> That. Then you can show that the Cauchy sequence is converged to a point in U, because if you have a sequence that goes to a point on, if you have a sequence that goes to a point inside of the uh, domain, then you have no problem. And if you have a sequence that goes to a point on boundary U, then that sequence cannot possibly be Cauchy. So, of course, this part requires some work uh, and you should try to do it either in uh, one metric or in, preferably in this setup because uh, this is really something you, sh you should see, to, you should see yourselves. So, uh, the corollary is, of course, if Cauchy sequences converge, then you can say that the, your domain, your bounded domain, is also is complete in uh, creditory metric. And since creditory metric is equal to Kobayashi metric, or since Cauchy sequences in one of the metrics, is, are Cauchy sequences in other metric, your domain is also complete in Kobayashi metric. As an exercise, uh, but you can use the internal tangent disk to prove that there is a constant such that the Kobayashi metric is less than or equal to, uh, to the value of Kobayashi metric at the point Z is less than or equal to C1 times 1 over delta. Uh, to show this, you can use the inclusion map from the disk to the domain. Now, you need to do the opposite of what we did uh, in the proof here. Uh, now, as an interesting exercise, uh, if you take U to be the analyst, D minus 0.0. Uh, if you look at this region, this domain, U does not have a C2 boundary. But you can still use Removable Singularities Theorem 
and also Cauchy estimates to find out how cardiotelemetric behaves near the boundary points here. On the uh, boundary of the disc, it will behave this similarly, but at the boundary point zero, things will go different. Now, if you look at this, you can see that uh, U is not complete with respect to cardiotelemetric. Also, check what happens what happens when you use Kobayashi metric instead of Kobayashi metric. Now we have a corollary. Uh, this corollary says any bounded finitely connected region in complex plane uh, with each boundary component being a Jordan curve. If you remember, a Jordan curve is a curve in the complex plane, uh, which is homeomorphic to the, to the circle. So if you have a bounded finitely connected region and your boundary uh, is consists of finitely uh, many connected Jordan curves, finitely many Jordan curves, then the predatory metric of your domain is also complete. Now, proof, I would very much like to say proof is as in the figure, uh, but this is only a sketch of the proof, which we will explain. Uh, now, what we want is to send a domain which looks like the first one in the figure to a domain which looks like the last one in the figure. Conformally, then we can since Cartesian-Dorimetric uh, is invariant under uh, conformal maps, we can conclude that uh, U is complete. Now, so let us first look at the case with a single hole. Now, what we do is we fill the hole to obtain a simply connected region, U prime. Then we use Riemann mapping theorem to map U to the disk. And then we unfill the hole again. Now we have a region, U double prime. This region has a circle as the outer boundary and it has a Jordan curve as the inner boundary. Then we take a point inside this hole, say that it, uh, we take point P, and we apply an inversion with respect to the point P. I mean, we take Z to the point one over Z minus P. When we do this, we invert our domain. Uh, the new region we get by doing this with triple prime has the outer domain uh, as the inner domain of our U double prime. We send our inner domain to the outer uh, uh, inner boundary. Uh, we send our inner boundary to the outer boundary of U triple prime, and vice versa, we send our outer boundary to the inner boundary of U triple prime. So then fill in the new hole. Now, this is a domain with the Jordan curve as the outer boundary and the circle and the circular hole inside that domain. Now we fill in the new hole and use Riemann map mapping theorem again and map U triple prime to a disk. Now what we have is here, uh, is a disk, uh, then of course we perform another inversion to exchange the outer and inner boundary boundaries again. Now you have a region you till there with smooth outer boundary and a smooth circular hole in it. And this utility is conformally cooling to you. So uh, this this says that uh, 
your your domain is complete with respect to the Kobayashi metric if you have a single hole. If boundary U has k components, then you can, k is finite, B to k finite, so you can use this technique k times to obtain a conformally equivalent domain with C2 boundary and conclude that this is true for such domains. And for this, we close this mini series. Uh, for further reading, you can uh, look at the it, the first one is the textbook we followed. Uh, the second one is the paper about Kaidatori and Kobayashi metrics by Stephen Kranz. And the third one is uh, Kranz's book, Geometric Analysis of the Bergman Kernel and Metric. But be careful, this deals with uh, several complex domains. So this is a bit advanced textbook. Uh, but if you are interested, you can have a look at the textbook. Uh, it tells the subject enthusiastically, <laughs> as Kranz does usually. The third one is, uh, again, the, creditor, the, the paper by Simha, the creditor metric from the end. So with this, we close the uh, series, series of our lectures. All right, great. Thanks for nice lectures. All right. Thank you for attending now. <laughs> so see you in hopefully other research schools. Yes. All right. Any questions? I'm here for a little while if you have any questions. All right, you can write from chat if you wish. All right, guys, we meet at 2.30. See you again. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Phuket, very much again, and see you. Okay. See you.